Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the, at this MDICX webinar, Advancing U.S. Early Feasibility Studies, CDRH, and MDIC Initiative. We have a terrific panel of speakers today to talk to us about early feasibility studies. By way of introduction, my name is Stephanie Christopher. I'm the Program Manager at MDIC for the Clinical Trial Innovation and Reform Project. And this early feasibility work is actually a small part of the, work, of the work that MDIC's clinical trials program is doing to advance clinical trials in the U.S. The vision of uh, the Clinical Trial Innovation and Reform Group at MDIC is that clinical trial innovation has the potential to improve the safety and effectiveness of products being introduced to the market, reduce clinical trial cycle times and costs, and yield earlier access to beneficial innovative technologies for U.S. patients. Our priorities include addressing infrastructure with regards to data collection, providing leadership in the use of innovative, efficient clinical trial designs, and providing tools and methods to facilitate early feasibility studies in the U.S. To do this, we use a multi-pronged approach here at MDIC. The first is the development of prioritized clinical trial tools, included, including the Blueprint for Early Feasibility Study Success, which we'll be talking about on today's webinar. In addition, we're also working on tools such as a framework for efficient medical device clinical trial design and a white paper and presentation on designing quality risk-based monitoring protocols. Another approach to leading the charge on clinical trial innovation is discussions that we hold through MDIC events, including in April we held a workshop on removing the barriers to improving efficiency and effectiveness of medical device clinical trials. And we have webinars planned for this fall and next spring, both on this MDIC Early Feasibility Blueprint and other CDRH guidances for clinical trials. And then in addition to these, we also lead the way by advancing publications to make the case for more efficient clinical trial design. And with that brief introduction, I'll turn, I'll turn things over to Owen Ferris and Carla Wiese from CDR, FDA CDRH to start things off by talking about CDRH's Early Feasibility Study Program. Uh, ...with other parts of the world, but it really sort of signifies what we're trying to do, which is ensure that devices are safe and effective, but also ensure that we are an active partner in moving innovative technologies forward. Um, and so you can turn to the next slide, please, Stephanie. Um, as part of our strategic goals for 2014 and 15, uh, we identified that one area we wanted to focus on, we had three strategic goals. Um, one of them was in the area of strengthening the clinical trial enterprise, and we divided that into two parts. I'm just going to very briefly touch on the first part, and then the rest of our talk will be on the second part. So the first was to improve the efficiency, consistency, and predictability of the IDE process, to reduce the time and number of cycles needed to reach appropriate full IDE approval in, for medical devices in general and for devices of public health importance in particular. Um, I've already presented some really exciting results in that space. Um, at the MDIC annual meeting back at the end of September. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that now, just to say that we've really made a lot of strides in terms of being a collaborative partner in moving important technologies through the clinical trial process. Um, our second priority is what we're here to talk about today, which is to increase the number of early feasibility first in human IDE studies submitted to FDA and conducted in the U.S. And now, obviously, this is an area where we have a little bit um, less direct influence and more, um, you know, we're trying to bring more of these studies into the agency, into the country, uh, recognizing that this is really important, but it really, it's, it's our focus is in terms of setting up an environment in which uh, companies want to bring those technologies forward where they see that, that as a, a viable pathway. Um, if you can turn to the next slide, please. So what have we been doing? We've had a busy couple of years in the clinical trial space. The first thing we did a couple of years ago was establish a clinical trials program and a clinical trials director. Um, and as part of that, we set up some uh, processes in place whereby we would have greater oversight uh, over the decisions that FDA was making and how we were communicating those decisions. So really our focus was three parts. One was ensuring that we're in the right place. If we're saying, no, you can't start this study right now, are we saying no for the right reasons, considering the benefits and the risks of that technology, uh, the options that are available to that patient population, the importance of potentially moving that technology forward, all of those 
elements go into deciding whether or not we're in the right place in terms of saying yes or no about moving a technology forward into a clinical trial. Second is are we being flexible where it's appropriate? So there are ways, and we're going to talk about some of those ways in the early feasibility phase, where we can be more flexible and allow studies to start while protecting patients um, in innovative ways. There might be mitigations where we can ensure that patients are adequately protected. There might be some testing that could be conducted in parallel um, with the starting of an initial clinical trial. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, um, are we being uh, optimal in our communication with sponsors? So we've initiated some processes where if we say no, if we've disapproved your IDE, uh, we're now picking up the phone and within a few days right after that decision and making sure that you understand why we said no uh, and working collaboratively with you to figure out the path forward that um, is achievable, is realistic, and continues to protect patients that would be in that study. Uh, and then the last thing is, is establish an early feasibility study program with coordinators um, both within the clinical trials program itself um, and then also um, specific uh, division reps in each of our device review divisions, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, next slide. And so why is it important to focus on EFS? Um, you know, we really see early feasibility studies as a critical step in the de device innovation and development process. There are really, we recognize that there are times when uh, we've moved as far as we can on the bench and in the animal, and we really can't figure out how to refine that design or refine how it will be used and figure out how to best study it in a larger study without getting it into a few patients and seeing what happens in a very careful and thoughtful way. And we also recognize that when those early feasibility studies are conducted in the U.S., then there's a greater likelihood that the next stage of study is going to be conducted in the U.S. We'll have investigators that are starting to familiarize their, themselves with that technology and that that will lead to a cascade of events whereby important technologies are more likely to be, be available both in the, in the clinical study setting and also in the eventual marketed device setting earlier to U.S. patients and we think that that's a really important step is to facilitate the early feasibility process. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide before I turn it over to Carla who's really running the show in the early feasibility space for CDRH. Um, and this just shows some of the progress that we've seen um, for, for FY 2015, which recently ended. Um, so we had a specific uh, goal in mind, um, and that's quoted right here, that by June 30th of 2015, compared to our FY 13 performance, we sought to increase the number of early feasibility first-in-human studies submitted to each pre-market division. And we pretty much met that. We had an increase in six of the seven ODE review divisions, our Office of Device Evaluation, and really the only reason we didn't make it in that seventh is because they had so many of those submissions in FY13. Um, we also saw a 50% increase in the early feasibility submissions for CDRH overall, and over a 100% increase in our approvals of early feasibility studies for CDRH. And we have a lot in the pipeline right now, and I think that that's an important point. We are in active discussions. Uh, with many companies right now in the early feasibility space. And so, you know, this is part of our outreach today is to make sure that folks know about the program. They know that we're really interested in rolling up our sleeves and working collaboratively with our device sponsors uh, to figure out how to safely move innovative products into the clinical setting. And with that, I'll turn it over to Carla. Thank you, Owen. Um, my name is Carla Weasley. I'm the policy analyst for the early feasibility program in the Office of Device Evaluation and CDRH. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about the status of this program. Next slide. Um, just to reiterate what Owen mentioned, um, the goal of this program is the approval of EFS IDEs, allowing patients in the U.S. the earliest access to potentially beneficial medical devices. Um, elements that define an early feasibility study um, include a device or therapy that is generally early in development, typically before it has been finalized, and a clinical study that has a small number of subjects. Next slide, please. The FDA recognizes that there are many reasons to, get, to conduct an EFS study. These may include uh, initial insights into safety, um, potential device failures, whether the device performs its intended purpose, um, what therapeutic parameters are, patient characteristics that may impact device performance, um, human factors or operator technique challenges. Next slide, please. 
In order to provide a program that encourages EFS in the United States, we recognize the need to reach out to our stakeholders. Our partner, MDIC, conducted a survey which has informed us on current thinking, and these are some of the results. Um, as you can see, the number one perceived challenge to starting, e to starting an EFS in the United States is the regulatory pathway. Um, however, 63% of those polled um, would be interested in, in doing a study in the United States. However, some relative skepticism remains. Next slide. So what is CDRH doing to support EFS in the United States? Um, some items that have been completed include the issuance of an EFS guidance to outline FDA's thinking on EFS and how FDA can be more flexible, the establishment of an EFS program and training EFS representatives in each ODE review division to assist sponsors and review teams. Um, we've also developed a CDRH Learn module focused on EFS, and there will be additional modules um, submitted in the future. And we've also ensured that file reviews are highly interactive. Um, some other items that we have in process um, include establishing EFS-specific non-clinical test considerations to ensure that the right testing is done at the right time. And we're also looking to increase engagement with EFS sponsors to further improve the program. Specifically, we're looking to gather feedback from sponsors who have completed an EFS submission or have one in process to learn their perspective on what has been difficult for them during the review process and what aspects of the process for program were helpful. Additionally, we would like to understand if there are fundamental differences in opinion on what non-clinical testing is required. Next slide. One of the key tenets of the guidance document is that the right testing be done at the right time. As mentioned in the previous slide, the FDA is working to establish EFS-specific test considerations to ensure that the right testing is done at the right time. We are doing this because we recognize that comprehensive testing during early phases of device development may add cost without significant return, and it may be acceptable to defer some non-clinical testing until the device design has been finalized. It is important to keep in mind that an early feasibility study incorporates enhanced risk mitigation strategies and patient protection measures as compared to a pivotal study. These enhanced risk mitigation strategies can be particularly useful when there is limited value in the available non-clinical testing. Next slide. So we've identified some EFS challenges to date, um, the first being the understanding and applying of the EFS tools, concept, and process by both the sponsors and the review teams, as this program is still relatively new. Um, the sponsors being able to clearly communicate the device evaluation strategy has been an additional challenge, and understanding and agreeing upon the appropriate amount of non-clinical testing to start the study. Um, there, like I mentioned, there's an FDA effort to determine ways to reduce our typical test requirements that may be impractical for EFS um, in areas such as biocompatibility and sterilization. Another challenge uh, noticed is that novel, tech, uh, novel test methodologies may need to be discussed to answer essential questions prior to clinical exposure, and in this case, we recommend early interaction with FDA. And lastly, leveraging data effectively has been a challenge for some sponsors. Next slide. And of course, the, the, the type of sponsor itself can be a challenge. Um, those submitting EFS proposals tend to be infrequent submitters who are less knowledgeable about the regulatory process and have less resources, such as the small startup companies and physician investigators. Next slide. Aside from these challenges, there are several benefits to participating in the EFS program. Um, these include early review team exposure to the technology and sponsor familiarity with FDA expectations. Uh, the review teams are very interactive in this process, recognizing that many EFS sponsors are interacting with FDA for the first time. Uh, the guidance provides specific methods to support the iteration of the device or procedure, and the program provides smoother transitions between phases of clinical evaluation. Next slide. So if you're interested in submitting an EFS proposal, uh, we have outlined a process to do so. Um, the first being to contact the EFS representatives via email or phone. This is an informal inter interaction, and it's meant to obtain current information on the EFS program and prepare for working with the review team. Um, second would be to submit the initial pre-submission. Uh, the goal of this is to educate the review team on the device in the clinical context and to reach agreement on the information needed in the report of prior investigations to support study initiation. 
Uh, third is to submit additional pre-submissions. Um, and the purpose of these being to obtain feedback on test protocols, the clinical study plan, and the informed consent, and also to address any questions or concerns raised by the review team. And finally would be submission of the IDE. When this happens, uh, interaction with the review team uh, will happen to address any concerns and continue interactions during the conduct of the study will be completed. Next slide. Uh, this graph is where we stand today with um, the number of early feasibility study IDE um, submissions received and approved for fiscal years uh, 13, 14, and 15. Um, we are seeing an increase in submissions and also in approvals, and we hope to see this trend continue. Next slide. Um, this is a list of uh, resources. Uh, we have the Early Feasibility Study Guidance, EFS CDRH Learn Modules, a pre-submission guidance, and also electronic submissions guidance for your reference. Next slide. And finally, this is the Early Feasibility Study team consisting of division representatives. You may contact directly if you know what division your um, product may fall under. Um, otherwise, you can also contact myself, Carla Weesey, Dr. Andrew Farb, or Dorothy Abel for general questions about the program. Great. Thank you so much, Carla and Owen. I'd like to now turn it over to um, Angela Mallory from NAMSA, and she's going to start our, our conversation on a sponsor perspective on, on some general strategy and perspective on how to approach early feasibility studies. Angela? Hi. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yep. You sound great. Fabulous. Thank you. I wanted to make sure that everyone could hear me. Um, so let's dig in a little bit and talk about early feasibility, some strategy and perspective. So first, let's, next slide, please. Let's talk about learning the process. And then we'll talk about the EFS lens, some realistic expectations, and then some advice. So in learning the process, please understand that the EFS program is not intuitive. There's certain things that we need to do, first of all. We need to understand if our device is a good fit. Does it meet the definition and scope of the directive? Does it meet your business model? And please understand that complicated devices are always going to take additional time to get through any process. You need to be comfortable with the guidance document and the spirit of the guidance document. We need to use the tools from the guidance. The first is that the structure of an EFS IDE is a little bit different. The report of prior investigations has three sections. It has a background section, an executive report, and detailed report. It's a little bit of a paradigm shift from your traditional IDE. Next are the device evaluation tables that Carla talked about. These are communication tools. They are not mandatory to use, but what is mandatory is that you show how you are leveraging previous versions of your device's data and that you are mitigating risk. Next, those, device, those same DES tables are used to highlight the data and to plan your responses to address where FDA is uncomfortable. Next slide, please. In the next two slides, I put up another set of examples of DES tables. I always like having additional examples when I'm putting together an IDE, and I thought I would provide a step for you. Remember in the DES tables, it's easy to give too much information. It's also easy to give too little. Next slide, please. So in this example, this is the second half of the big, long DES tables. We found it useful to color code them. Column six, seven, eight, and nine. Column six is your bench and animal testing on your previous version of your device. Column seven is your leveraged previous human data, while column eight and column nine are your planned or completed testing on your current version of the device. Next slide, please. Let's look at things through an EFS lens a little bit. Remembering the end goal of an EFS IDE is a limited human clinical trial. And what is the purpose of this limited human clinical trial? It's to finalize the design of your device and to understand 
clinical aspects of your device before moving into your next trial. You're going to leverage previous versions of your device for some of your clinical data. You can leverage some bench testing, biocompatibility testing, animal testing, and others. But remember, you need to explain, justify, and draw conclusions on that leverage data. And how do we do that? You have to map out your leverage device as compared to your current device, what is same and what is different. Next slide. Realistic expectations. Planning and organization are very key to an EFS IDE. I'm going to restate this again and probably several more times that we need to be clear about what we are leveraging and what we are not. What testing are we doing on the current version of the device and what are we leveraging on previous versions? The format is different. Use the guidance document as a checklist. Use pre-submission meetings as Carla talked about Use those pre-sub meetings to identify areas of concern from FDA, and also use those pre-sub meetings to identify ways to address those areas of concern. But those pre-sub meetings can extend your timelines. If you go through several rounds of 90-day pre-sub meetings, those can extend your timelines a little bit. And finally, help your FDA review team. State often and frequently how your EFS conclusions are based. Use your justifications, and then also state why some items that a reviewer would typically see are not included. Next slide. And then finally, some advice. We all know we need to tell the IDE story. It's not as easy as just going through a checklist and listing all of the items. We need to be comfortable with the early feasibility program. Map out your previous versions of your device. Be very clear about what you're leveraging. Include justifications and conclusions. Use those pre-sub meetings to identify what the hot buttons are from FDA and use them on, to agree how to resolve those issues. And finally, I suggest lots and lots of caffeine and sugar to get you through the process. Great, thank you, Angela. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Victoria Pearson from Medtronic. She's going to give another perspective on a um, her part or her part group's participation in the early feasibility pilot. Vicky. Great, right, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute, everyone. So um, I'm hoping to build on uh, Angela's presentation and, and share a, a real-world example from Medtronic. So I apologize. I realized I didn't put my name on the title, but uh, on the title slide here. But my name is Vicki Pearson, and I'm the, the VP of Regulatory in Medtronic Aortic and Peripheral Vascular Business Unit, which is headquartered out in California. So the example I wanted to share with you is the, the Mona Lisa, or Mona LSA, standing for left subclavian artery thoracic branch. And I have an image here on this slide on the right, and you can see this is a um, stent graft, a covered stent graft, and um, there are two components to it. There's a main stent graft, or the MSG it's called, and then a branch stent graft, which um, is a two-piece system. So if we go on to the next slide, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this device. So the um, Mona Lisa device is indicated, uh, or a proposed indication, I should say, because it's still under an IDE, is for the treatment of thoracic aortic aneurysm. And as the image on the left here, so you have an image of the heart with the three great vessels. And this is, is not the Mona Lisa device in this case. It's, um, precursor device, the valiant device, and you can see um, the aneurysm, the bulging um, section of the aorta, the graft is implanted in the aorta to uh, uh, bypass that aneurysm. And you can see in this image that the stent graft is actually covering the LSA in this image. So uh, the, the purpose of the Mona Lisa is really to preserve patency of the LSA while treating these types of aneurysms. And if you 
do cover the LSA, typically the physician will do a secondary procedure, so that's increasing, adding increased risk. So uh, this is an endovascular approach in lieu of an uh, open surgical approach. If you go on to the next slide, you can see this is just an image of the aorta here and the, the great vessels up in the branch of the aorta. And the vessel on the, the far right is the left subclavian artery. So many people who have thoracic aneurysms have too many comorbidities, and thus they're not good candidates for open surgery, which historically was, was the treatment of choice. And uh, endovascular repair of a thoracic aortic aneurysm does require um, healthy tissue proximal or near the heart, um, proximal to the heart, or a, what we call a landing zone. So we need to have enough healthy tissue to uh, land the stent graft and, main, and achieve adequate seal. Unfortunately, about 40% of patients that have these types of aneurysms but can't benefit from, from endovascular treatment because they have a pathology that doesn't have adequate landing zone, or um, so that eliminates that as an option. Or, as I mentioned in the very first slide, they cover that LSA and then have to have other procedures to restore blood flow to the LSA. So um, the outcome of coverage of the LSA is associated with higher rates of arm ischemia, paraplegia, a stroke, and death. So the Mona Lisa um, provides a single branch. It's intended to be an off-the-shelf device, not a custom device, to preserve patency of the LSA. So just a little background about this device, because I think it's important to understand why we thought it was a good candidate for, for this feasibility program. So if you go on to the next slide, So Medtronic considered the Mona Lisa a good candidate because it's a novel application that's going to address an unmet need where we have to cover, cover the LSA. In accordance with the FDA guidance, early feasibility studies are appropriate early in the device development when clinical, uh, additional clinical experience is necessary because non-clinical test methods are not available or they're not adequate to provide the information that we need to advance the development of the device. Um, however, it's very important, as Carla mentioned, um, or excuse me, not Carla, Angela mentioned, that we, uh, we have appropriate risk mitigation in place. So we have to demonstrate that the benefits of this unproven therapy are um, outweigh any risk, and so we do have to have adequate protection, human protection measures. So one of the ways we mitigate the risk is, and I, I think Angela spoke to this as well, is using known materials. So in this case, we leverage the, the commercially available PMA-approved Valiant stent graft, and that was the basis of using a lot of the same materials as that proven therapy. So risks are mitigated through material selection as well as a program of, comp uh, in this case, we did comprehensive computational modeling and bench testing were performed. Uh, the target vessel, the LSA, as I mentioned previously, does have a history of being covered, and thus that was a risk mitigation because if, if the device failed to perform as we hoped it would and, and the, we didn't maintain perfusion to the LSA, the, the, the patient was really at no increased risk compared to the, the current therapy. And so the physician could intercede with a secondary procedure and um, restore blood flow to the LSA. We, um, the procedure was validated preclinically in a porcine model, and then we also used uh, sim use testing in a, um, a human model that we created. Unfortunately, though, there were major differences between the porcine and the human model. And the limited data that we, we had access to indicated that movement in the porcine model is much more aggressive than the human model. And this was measured via 4D computed tomography angiography. 
So the, the porcine was not a good model, but it was the best animal model available. Furthermore, there was no published data on human respiratory and cardiac motion at, at the ostium of the LSA. Thus, there was a need to verify the design in humans before moving into a pivotal clinical trial. We needed to further evaluate the procedural steps of the implant itself, the human factors, uh, the impact on, on the clinician, and the patient characteristics that would be appropriate for this um, this device. And this is kind of in line with, as Carla said, doing the right testing at the right time. So if we move on to the next slide. So on November 10th, 2011, FDA released the draft guidance for early feasibility ID studies. And at the same time, they announced a pilot program which was going to um, accept nine suitable IDE candidates into this pilot program. It just so happened that we happened to have a, a pre-scheduled meeting with FDA on November 10th, 2011. And fortunately for us, we're in California. This guidance document came out in the morning and we were able to quickly adjust our, our, our meeting with, with the agency to suggest that we were a good candidate for this pilot program. So we moved very quickly quickly because we, we really felt strongly we wanted to be in the pilot program. We re viewed this as a great opportunity to partner um, with the agency on an innovative program that would meet a business critical need for us. So uh, in December 2011, so a month later, Medtronic submitted a proposal to be considered as one of the candidates for the early feasibility program. And we were accepted into the program 30 days later on January 13, 2012. And um, we put forth a lot of the same rationale that, that I covered previously on why we thought we um, were appropriate for this pilot program. So if you move on to the next slide, there's a, a timeline that just kind of walks you through uh, what happened. So can we move to the next slide? Stephanie? Are you can not seeing the slides the dance? No, I'm still, I, oh, I want to move on to the next slide with the timeline on it. Um, that's the. Um, uh, You're we showing maybe that? are having a little. We're maybe having a little bit of a delay on the the slides because that's the slide. That's the slide I'm on. Stephanie, okay. this is Owen. this is Owen. That's the slide we see too. We see the timeline. Okay. Oh, it's interesting. So I'm the only one that doesn't see it. Okay, well, that's good. I have it in front of me. So um, as the timeline shows, there was um, a significant amount of FDA and Medtronic interactions from the time we were selected into the pilot program in January 2012 and when the IDE was approved um, actually a, a, a year later. So we had several um, formal and informal, I should say, informal and formal communications uh, throughout the process. It was very collaborative, and I felt like um, we really improved our relationship with our FDA reviewers throughout this process. And we did leverage uh, the pre-submission pathway was heavily utilized throughout, throughout. Yeah, I see it just kind of dumped me out of this, but I'm glad everyone else can see the slide. So again, kind of stepping through, uh, the IDE was submitted on January 31st, 2013. The IDE was conditionally approved 30 days later on March 1st, 2013, and we had full approval on April 19th. And we actually had the, the first patient implanted that same month. So you can see the process actually for us moved very quickly once we actually submitted the, the IDE. So if you go on to, to the next slide, I just wanted to cover uh, the results from the Medtronic perspective. So the time to first in human implant, we believe, was shortened by approximately two years using the early feasibility strategy as compared to the standard 
IDE and product development route. We were able to reduce or eliminate many of our Medtronic internal processes and testing that would typically be required for a commercial program. So the focus was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, on doing the right testing at the right time. Non-clinical testing strategy was determined based on a risk-based approach. Thus, we shortened the development timeline and we, uh, this was all documented in the device evaluation strategy table, which uh, Angela shared with you. The traditional product development program activities were, were re-evaluated at Medtronic. We re-engineered them for this project. We focused on specific deliverables that impact patient safety and efficacy, which helped to reduce the overall program timeline. Uh, just some examples of that, we didn't create a marketing plan. This was not a commercial program. We didn't create a labeling plan, uh, et cetera. So the clinical study was designed specifically to obtain information that would help in further enhancing the device design and the procedural steps while focusing on patient safety. The results from the study um, will be used to design stent grafts for total arch treatment solutions in the future. And we, we feel that the data required for these innovative designs would not have been possible without um, doing early feasibility studies. So if you go on to the, the next slide, hopefully it says current status. I um, just wanted to share that we have um, successfully completed the early feasibility study and we have now moved from early feasibility into a feasibility program and we are in the process of developing the strategy for initiating the pivotal clinical trial. On the next slide, uh, I wanted to share just a few lessons learned as we move through the, uh, the EFS process. I think the, the biggest one is uh, goodwill was gained by supporting FDA's new innovation pathway. We developed a strong partnership with the agency by being very transparent on what we learned throughout the device evolution. So there were several designs that, uh, several learnings through early development and testing. We learned what worked, what didn't work, and we shared that with the agency throughout the process from an engineering perspective. Um, we partnered closely with FDA to really fine tune the device evaluation strategy. Um, it, this was new to both industry and the agency, so it was a partnership to develop uh, the EFS table, which is a key tool for evaluation of risk benefits and test plans. We continue, continuously interacted with FDA reviewers and management throughout the process to ensure success of the program, and we utilized the, the new five-day notices throughout as appropriate as they're outlined in the FDA guidance document. So if you move on to the... Um, Next slide, there are further lessons learned. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important is that as you pick your investigators for your early feasibility uh, studies, in this case, the two investigators that were part of this study were very involved from the beginning on the design of the device. They were experienced researchers and they had uh, appropriate clinical trial infrastructure um, at their institutions, so including an IRB, study coordinators, et cetera. And we learned that, that physician training on, on this device and, and proctoring was, was critical. Feedback from the investigators as well as engineers attending the cases helped us to make appropriate design and procedural modifications. Based on the success of this program, an early feasibility guidance document was developed and released across the, the Medtronic Cardiac and Vascular Group so that we could do more of these types of studies in the future. So the last slide, uh, conclusions, I, I feel strongly that this was an excellent opportunity for, for Medtronic for this indication, our few, first in human uh, study in the U.S. It was a strong partnership with FDA and clinicians, and it's our goal to continue to do this to help um, bring innovation back to the U.S. So thank you very much.
Great. Thank you so much, Vicki. And with that, we'll turn it over um, next to Kareem Benali from ABO Med. And M Kareem is also the chair of the MDIC Early Feasibility Working Group. And he's going to share a little bit about some of the work that MDIC is doing to continue to help support the advancement of early feasibility studies in the U.S. Kareem? Here, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Kareem Benali. I'm the chief medical officer for Abiumed. And if uh, there was any doubt uh, about the accent that you're hearing, let me clarify that, you know, Abiumed is a U.S. company headquartered in uh, Massachusetts and that manufacture class three devices uh, in circuitry support field. And I think that is uh, important, you know, with respect to the context of the subject that we are talking about today. So I have, as uh, Stephanie outlined, uh, you know, the honor to chair the MDIC EFS working group uh, as a volunteer. And I have to say that, uh, you know, we have learned a ton, I mean, since we have started this initiative, uh, and I'm really glad to see that we have a large number of participants today, I mean, to, uh, in this webinar. So, Stephanie, if you don't mind, I mean, moving to the next slide, please. So I thought first I will start by stating, I mean, the strategic importance of the early feasibility studies in the U.S. and why is it important, especially for the patient. I will then share with you some of, of the lessons that we have learned and what actually we have decided to do with what we have learned. And then I will finish by speculating on the future uh, and share with you some of the future perspectives that we see for this uh, private uh, public partnership and also for this uh, initiative. So before I go any further, if you don't mind, Stephanie, next slide. I would like I me mean, to define the problem that we face, I mean, with the EFS in the United States. So it is true that the United States, I mean, continue to command a leadership position with respect, I mean, in, in, in the global medical space. But if you consider, I mean, uh, the, the, the scope of the of the field uh, with respect to the medical devices, there are about like 6,500 medical companies uh, in the United States. Uh, what is important to know is that the vast majority of these companies are small companies with less than 50 employees or so, which means that the vast majority of these companies have limited funds and also resources. So regardless actually of the size of the company, the business leaders need to rely on efficient, transparent, and predictable ecosystem to make well-informed decisions. <clears throat> uh, and one is to keep the business afloat, and then also trying to bring the innovative technology to the market. So in other terms, if you put it in simple terms, I mean, longer development times will increase the R&D cost, and therefore, we reduce the innovation incentives. So. Uh, with that context, and because of the obligation to keep the business afloat, I mean, in the current era that we live in, you may probably find it fair or perhaps unfair, but businesses can and will conduct research overseas anytime, I mean, the legal, regulatory, financial environments are more favorable than they are in the U.S. So the first impact uh, as, you know, that follows that strategy is basically a delay access basically to the, to the patients for innovative technologies in the U.S. and also <clears throat> limited access of the physician as well to that technology. So to put things into perspective, if you don't mind, Stephanie, next slide, please. Uh, to put that into perspective, you know, I thought important, for instance, to share with you some uh, of the, you know, objective data. And a recent report from Advamed has shown that, uh, or showed that it takes about six and a half years and about 36 million for a company to bring a device, a class three device from the batch testing to basically the first early feasibility studies. That is an enormous burden, especially for small companies, which are, by the way, driving a big part of that innovation. And that potentially can limit the innovation uh, if we consider that aspect of things. So. If you look at the next slide, please, if you look at the different challenges that are being faced by these companies, uh, beyond the uh, regulatory challenge that we uh, always talked about, actually there are other many uh, challenges that are being faced by these companies. There are ethics committees challenges with respect to the review cycle and the processes, legal challenges with respect to the contract, the right to patents, the IP, 
cost, the cost of insurance, reimbursement, but also some ethical and safety challenges that the companies have to deal with when approaching the EFS, basically the early feasibility studies in the U.S. Uh, next slide, please. So FDA has really and clearly announced its interest, I mean, for the early feasibility studies, and you have heard earlier, I mean, uh, in this webinar, I mean, Owen and Carla, stating actually in conveying a very encouraging perspective and share some of the important progress that they have made lately with respect to the basically regulatory perspective. So uh, FDA really needs to be congratulated for the significant progress that we have made, I mean, in the EFS over the last 18 to 24 months, and I will get back to that, sharing some specific examples as, as we move forward in this uh, basically discussion. So the willingness is there, and from the FDA for sure, but it's imperative really that the industry leaders, other stakeholders, and including the patient advocates groups that uh, agree on a practical plan to enable the process to function as smoothly as possible and as efficiently as possible for this program to be successful. So. And that's where we believe that the MDIC can play a pivotal role in this whole process because through its public and private partnership, the MDIC can work on identifying basically the barriers that exist for these challenges, try to bridge the gap between the different stakeholders and potentially propose solutions in order to make the whole ecosystem more efficient as we bring new technologies into the market and, uh, you know, starting with basically the EFS. Uh, so, and I would like to share for the next slides basically that uh, we will uh, talk about what are the progress that we have made. Next slide, please. Uh, so about a year ago, the group was tasked to examine the different barriers, as I mentioned, for the EFS in the U.S. and potentially propose solutions for debate. So we elected, the group elected to focus on really short-term deliverables in order to secure small wins, so to gain traction and gain some credibility so we can tackle bigger and longer, basically, tasks after we have identified what needs to be done. So the, fir the phase one was all about basically putting a team together, getting started and getting organized. And we start by interviewing some of the key stakeholders, and from that we moved on to basically conduct a large survey that included representation both, I mean, from, I would say, the industry, FDA, CROs, IRBs, uh, in order to get a sense of what are the common barriers that people were seeing with the EFS and potential try to think about basically potential uh, solutions. So you can find them in the full results of the survey on the link that is on that presentation. It's on the MDIC web website, so please feel free, I mean, to uh, consult that sur survey. You may probably learn some of the information that is, you may probably find useful. Uh, our analysis of that survey, next slide, please. Uh, we thought that, you know, the uh, stakeholders wanted the MDIC to focus on three, three main Things. I mean, number one uh, is to develop a kind of what we call now a blueprint book that will be a comprehensive guide on how to conduct the EFS in the U.S. So remember, most of the companies out there operate with limited staff, and many don't have the infrastructure uh, for regulatory and quality personnel that will be available, for instance, in bigger corporations. So a how-to book will be beneficial from their perspective. Second. Uh, the group thought that they can have, like, the, uh, you know, uh, the MDIC can have an impact with respect to the training and education. And third, basically, the uh, stakeholders encourage the MDIC members, I mean, to continue to work with the FDA and the IRBs in order to further streamline the process with respect to the EFS. So that feedback helped to reshape, basically, the roadmap for a phase two and a phase three. As you can see in the phase two, basically, that has to do primarily with the blueprint, blueprint book and also the training and education. And one of the things that we are doing today is to have that webinar that continue to promote the EFS in the, U the U.S., working with the FDA, the industry, uh, as well as, I mean, the IRBs and other stakeholders. 
and to try to educate people on the efficiencies on the process that we're having here to make the process more basically um, streamlined uh, and more efficient. The third phase, we will try to identify five to ten companies with technologies that will be basically following the EFS program to collect more information as we move through the entire ecosystem, share it to the different stakeholders and be able basically to get some concrete action out of it. So I'm going to spend some time describing a little bit of them in the blueprint book because that's where we wanted today to talk about and, and why we believe, you know, uh, your involvement in this will be important. Next slide. So the blueprint book, basically, we it's meant to be a comprehensive guide on how to conduct the early feasibility studies in the U.S. It's meant to be a source that will include useful, useful information and also references for those that are seeking to conduct an EFS in the U.S. So it will provide an overview of the scope of the EFS and cover a variety of perspectives from the patient's perspective, business perspective, regulatory, legal, research perspective. And will also include the reimbursement insurance and the insurance basically challenges that are being faced by the company and how potentially it can address them. And also discuss some potential funding opportunities for small companies as well as, I mean, large companies that can potentially rely on NIH fundings to basically uh, do and conduct those first early feasibility studies. Um, next slide, please. So, the uh, guide, actually, it uh, acts as basically it's a source for information directing the re reader uh, to or, you know, the people that want to use it to, uh, I would say, uh, the appropriate governing bodies, to the agencies for each subject that is covered in, in, the, in, the, blue, in the blue uh book and also provide some links and references that can be used by the people that will use it. So it's not meant to replace any of the processes or policy or procedures or any official documents for official documents, for instance, from the FDA or CMS or NIH. It's really a, a courtesy, I would say, reference that will try to provide basically references and links that hopefully will be useful. So we do anticipate to have uh, a first draft circulated, I mean, within the working group uh, shortly. Uh, then by the end of the year, which is the end of this quarter, hopefully we'll have a version that will be available for the NDIC members so they can uh, review it, consult it, and also provide feedback before we have a, a general release to the general public and be put on the, uh, basically, the NDIC website. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, I mean, the willingness is there for the different stakeholders uh, and people have a vested interest, I mean, into the EFS. Now, uh, you know, have things really gotten better over the last year? So, I think it's probably too early to say for the program, but the reality is you have heard Owen say, I mean, earlier and Carla as well, I mean, the we are making progress and we are heading in the right direction. So, these initiatives will have, like, to be uh, encouraged. Uh, there are still some unresolved issues and some fair skepticism remains, uh, and that's where we believe, I mean, in working together, trying to resolve this issue and having, like, more companies, I mean, applying for the EFS with the FDA will make this program stronger because it's still in the early phase, but we want to see really more new technologies start their first innovation, first in man, the first early feasibility studies in the United States. So I will conclude by saying, if you don't mind, Stephanie, in the last slide, that, you know, the early feasibility studies has been proven to be feasible. You have heard Owen saying, I mean, the really, if, um, using some of the statistics that are pretty, actually, I would say, from our perspective, were really uh, pleasant to see and they were really encouraging. 
uh, success stories uh, are out there, they exist. We need more of these success stories, so the MDIC will continue to work with the different stakeholders, I mean, to try to make, uh, you know, the EFS a real success in the U.S. So I just want to finish by, uh, uh, you know, uh, thanking and also acknowledging, I mean, the contribution for, uh, on the last slide. Uh, Stephanie, next one, please, of the different members that have really been actively participating in this program. They have volunteering, I mean, they have been volunteering their time. Uh, it's been uh, an unbelievable uh, experience working with them. It's been really fun to work with all this group. Uh, I personally learned a lot, uh, and I think we'll continue to work together to bring, uh, you know, good things, I think, for this program, working with Owen, Carla, the FDA, uh, the industry leaders, as well as the other stakeholders for the EFS. So thank you for being on the call today, and I hope that, you know, you have learned something that will be useful for you, your company, or for what you do out there for the EFS. Thanks. Uh, great. Thank you, Kareem. Um, and I do. we do have a couple of minutes left. If um, anyone has any questions that they would like to submit, you can submit those questions via the chat box on, on your screen. Um, but I want to just kind of emphasize what, what Kareem said. Um, MDIC is a, a public-private partnership, and, and part of our, our strength is our ability to, to bring folks together, to work together, um, to um, it really advance this field. And so as, um, as Kareem said, we will have a draft of the Early Feasibility Blueprint available um, later this year, and we encourage you to um, take a look at it, have your, have your teams take a look at it, other staff members at your organizations. And really, um, we hope that you would provide us with feedback because ultimately our goal at MDIC for all of the tools that we create is to create something that's ultimately going to be a really useful tool for all of you. So um, you will, you'll keep an eye out for a, or an email from MDIC in the coming weeks um, with that draft, and we look forward to receiving, um, to receiving your, your feedback on that. Kareem, you had mentioned that um, one of the, the first things that we did for this project was we had um, had some kind of high-level kind of conversations or interviews with, with different stakeholders in the, um, in the medical device ecosystem. Um, I'm wondering if you can uh, tell the group a little bit about um, some of the, the other challenges that were identified beyond the, the regulatory challenge and kind of how we hope to address that in the blueprint. Yeah, I think, you know, we talked about, you know, one legal challenges, like for instance, the IP was the intellectual property was something uh, that was one of the challenges because what we, um, you know, the feedback that we collected is basically if you're doing something in the U.S., to paraphrase one of the basically uh, respondents in the survey, all eyes are on it. When you do it overseas, I mean, you can probably, you know, have probably less visibility to that. Uh, IP is an issue uh, as well because of uh, the way, you know, the companies work with basically university hospitals. Um, we are trying to address that and try to find, I mean, ways in how we can get people to a certain comfortable level so they can move forward with that. Another issue, and I think uh, one of the questions that we have has to do with the reimbursement that uh, uh, has become, especially, I mean, uh, recently, uh, you know, potential problem, especially for the small companies, because it, it appears that for some, uh, and may probably be all for the EFS, I mean, when you do an EFS, the whole procedure may not be probably reimbursed, not only the device, but the whole procedure. So we are trying to work as well with different stakeholders to understand the magnitude of the problem, and also as we do that, there might, might be probably some middle ground where we can have people, I mean, sit at the table and say, okay, well, we, we can do that depending that each, you know, from, like, for instance, from the reimbursement, uh, you know, perspective, can we get to a level where the, um, the uh, for instance, the procedure can get reimbursed and, and the device will be like a different question that will be addressed between the sponsor and, and basically the hospital. So there are some unresolved issues uh, that we are trying basically to, to First, I mean, uh, we are uncovering, but I mean, we will try to address as we move forward. All this, I mean, will be discussed openly, uh, you know, in different forums uh, the NDIC is having, uh, and either, I mean, through the um, Blueprint book or through other venues. Great. 
Thank you. Um, and I just had a question come in, and, and I think you actually touched on this a little bit already, um, but I, I'll give others a chance to weigh in. Um, the question says, given CMS decision only to reimburse pivotal studies, should, be, should it be assumed there will be no reimbursement for EFS? Um, and I don't know if we have, I know on our panel we don't have any CMS representation, but um, Owen or Carla, I don't know if you might be able to, to make a comment on that. Um, so this is Owen, um, and I think you know, this is an area that there's a lot of uh, active work going on in collaboration between FDA and CMS to try to figure this out. Um, you know, I think that it's notable that a lot has changed in terms of the reimbursement space for clinical studies starting on January 1 of this year. CMS centralized those decisions um, so that they were made at, at, at CMS Central in terms of whether studies would be reimbursed, all studies, not just feasibility studies. And so, you know, I think that there there is some evolution going on right now in terms of figuring out exactly how um, this will play out in terms of certain studies being reimbursed, um, whether they be early feasibility, traditional feasibility, or, of course, pivotal. Um, you know, I think that, that that's just going to take a little bit of time to, to, to work out all of those kinks, and, and there's, you know, a collaborative effort going on to try to address that. Great. Thank you, Owen. All right. Well, we are at a little bit past the top of the hour here, and I don't see any other questions in, in our queue here. But um, I want to thank our speakers um, for, for joining us today, for giving us a, a great uh, variety of perspectives on this on this exciting program. And um, I'll make one more plug. As I, you know, as we've said, we will have that that blueprint available for um, for your comment um, later later this fall. So we look forward to continuing the discussion on this program and, and really continuing to, to make this a, a strong program so that um, we can keep this terrific innovation happening in the medical device industry happening here in the U.S. So, um, so thank you. And we will also be um, posting the, um, the recording from today's webinar on the MDIC website in the coming days in case um, you have colleagues that you want to pass it along to. So thank you very much. Thank you.